As you mentioned, my name is Emily Stevens, and today I will be presenting on my capstone project titled Rising Resilience, Quantifying the Benefits of Nature-Based Solutions to Sea Level Rise in, of course, Imperial Beach, California. We've got a theme going. Here is the outline of my presentation today. I will start with my introduction, which includes some information on sea level rise, adaptation planning, and the city of Imperial Beach. Then I will move on to my project's aims and methodology, and then the results of my cost-benefit analysis, and then I'll wrap up with my discussion and conclusion. So as I'm sure we are all very aware, sea level rise is a direct consequence of anthropogenic climate change, meaning as temperatures continue to rise, so will sea levels, threatening coastal infrastructures, habitats, and communities around the globe. Cities are confronted with sea level rise, and as they are feeling these impacts, more and more communities are taking preventative actions, including armoring the shoreline with gray infrastructures, such as seawalls, or green infrastructures, which are nature-based solutions, such as living shorelines and beach nourishment projects. The city of Imperial Beach is unfortunately a very good example of a city that has had to deal with the impacts of sea level rise, as Alex so beautifully explained. It's located in San Diego County, and it's unique as it's surrounded on three sides by water. We have the San Diego Bay to the north, the Pacific Ocean to the west, and the Tijuana River, River Estuary to the south. So as you can probably guess, they are faced with inundation on all three sides, making them very vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. They have made efforts to adapt to these changes in many ways, including the construction of seawalls, various form of individual property armoring, and beach nourishment projects, with the most recent being the San Diego Regional Beach Sand Project number two in 2012. So they have taken action, but as increased levels of greenhouse gas emissions lead to faster rates of sea level rise, adaptation measures must mirror that increase in intensity. As a city is looking to longer-term, cost-effective solutions to sea level rise, nature-based solutions are emerging as a very strong contender. As mentioned, nature-based solutions employ natural infrastructures and ecosystems to combat rising seas. They are growing in popularity because they emulate the natural e ecosystems, effectively combating climate change impacts while also promoting long-term biodiver di biodiversity and other co-benefits. This type of project is relatively new, and the research on their co-benefits is somewhat limited, which leads to various barriers to implementation, including, but not limited to, lack of funding and also lack of general commu community and governmental support. Thus, my project aims to overcome these challenges and garner that widespread support by creating a framework to quantify and communicate each project's entire value in order to demonstrate that these projects are worth investing in. This framework takes the form of a cost-benefit analysis, which is outlined up here. So first, we identified which projects to include in our analysis. Then we looked at each project's physical attributes. Then we looked at their costs, their benefits, and then we brought it all back together for one large comparative analysis. Now, given Imperial Beach's unique geographic location, no one solution could be implemented on all three sides. So we divided IB into three zones, which are displayed here in figure two. And these zones were partitioned in this way because of the different ecology in each zone. So zone one, as you can see, incorporates the San Diego Bay and some salt ponds. Zone two contains sand and cobble beaches. And then in zone three is the Tijuana River Estuary, which is, of course, an estuary ecosystem. We did find that any projects that reside within zone three are actually technically not included in the city's jurisdiction. So the only zones further included in this analysis are zones one and zones two. Step one in our cost-benefit analysis was identifying which nature-based solutions to look at. Based on historic adaptation measures and also discussions with local officials, we decided to analyze three. So in zone one, we have living levees, and then in zone two, we have beach nourishment and dune restoration projects. The cost-benefit analyses were performed on a projected timeline of the year 2020 to 2100, and this is just to align with the IPCC's end-of-century climate change projections and also to follow many of the city's planning guidelines. Given this timescale, when appropriate, a discount rate of 1% was applied to the project in order to accurately represent their value. So that was step one of the cost-benefit analysis, identifying which projects to look at, and then we then ran through steps two through five for each individual project. So starting with zone one, the only project in zone one is a project that's actually already being completed by the city, which is the Bayshore Bikeway Resiliency Project. This encompasses a 1.2 mile segment of the Bayshore Bikeway Corridor. And as you can see in the figure on the right, right, it will uh, result in the elevation of the bikeway using a living levee and an ecotone slope. 
The costs of this project have already been estimated by the city, so things like permitting, design, construction costs, and more all come together for a total estimated cost of approximately $22 million. Now moving on to the benefits, these are quantified by the potential increase in housing value of the homes that the levy will protect, given that they will now be protected from potential, flood, uh, from potential flooding. A 2023 study looked at the impact of levies and other similar structures on housing values, and they concluded that one year after an, after an adaptation project's completion, property values rose by 5%, and five years after completion, property values rose by 10%. So the housing stock value of the homes that will be protected by the project was multiplied by 5% 5, 5 and 10% for the estimated total benefits. And that resulted in the net present the net present value of about 3.5 million to 13.3 million one year after the project's completion, and about 29 million to 48.3 million dollars five years after the project's completion. So that is zone one, and we'll now move on to zone two. And this is where we are considering both beach nourishment and dune restoration. For these projects, there are certain dimensions and aspects that we held constant between the two projects to make them easier to compare to each other. So first, for both of the projects, we assume that they were completed across the entirety of the 1.5 mile coastline of Imperial Beach. And then secondly, utilizing information from the city. For both projects, there is an initial nourishment event with re-nourishment events occurring every 10 years. And this is, this is to account for any erosion that occurs to the project. So first, I will discuss beach nourishment. And this is when sand is imported and added to the beach to build up the width that has been lost from erosion. The original 50-foot beach, we assumed, would be nourished to 150 feet, making the initial nourishment area approximately 925,000 cubic yards. Then we applied sand erosion rates to the beach on the years between nourishment events, and the volume of each re-nourishment event could then be found, resulting in the measurements shown here in Table 1. The cost of nourishment was then very easily found by multiplying the volume of each nourishment event by the cost of sand, and then summing up those values produced the future value total cost of nourishment. That discount rate of 1% was applied, and that resulted in the total present value cost of about $48.4 million. Now, the main benefits to beach nourishment are reflected in the recreational value that is added to the beach from the project. The value of this additional beach width is demonstrated by a person's willingness to pay to recreate at the beach. And a 2016 study found this average to be about $0.575 per additional foot of beach width. So we multiplied this value by each year's additional footage and by the estimated yearly beach attendance, and that resulted in the future value recreational benefits. That same discount rate was applied, resulting in the present value benefits, which made the net benefits of beach nourishment about $592 million to about $1 billion. And then next, dune restoration. This is the construction of dunes to mirror the natural ecology and functioning of the beach. The same process that we used for beach nourishment was used here, except there are now two measurements that we must look at, and that is the width of a cobble berm and the width of a dune, as you can see up here on the right. The initial dune restoration project includes a cobble berm at a width of 50 feet, followed by a sand dune nourishment at a width of 30 feet. And then ut utilizing cobble and sand dune erosion rates given by the city, the subsequent re-nourishment widths of cobble and dam dune sand were calculated. The added width of material was multiplied by their respective costs. And then discount rates were applied, and the total present value cost was estimated to be about $136 million. Now, the primary benefit of dune restoration is the flood protection benefits that they provide. So dune restoration benefits can be quantified just like how we did for the Bayshore Bikeway Resiliency Project, just with slightly different numbers. So a study completed in 2017 estimates the economic impact of dune restoration to be a housing stock value increase of about 3.6%. Using this number, the benefits of this project are estimated to be about $35.5 million to $66.5 million. These numbers do result in negative net benefits of about negative $70 million to negative $100 million. However, there are additional benefits provided by the project that should also be considered. 
So we have quantified the main benefits of each project. However, nature-based solutions are unique compared to gray solutions because while they do provide flood protection benefits and the benefits that I quantified here, the fact that they emulate and enhance the natural environment creates these additional co-benefits that are very important to consider. So for zone one, the Bayshore Bikeway Resiliency Project, flooding in the past has inhibited the bikeway's use, but elevating the path will allow for ease of recreational activity, which is of course very benef beneficial for the physical and mental health of the community. This project also most directly impacts the Bayside community in Northern Imperial Beach. This community is a largely low-income, disadvantaged community who have historically lacked the necessary resources to respond to climate change impacts. And this really just emphasizes the importance of the potential benefits that this project will provide. Now in zone two, there are multiple additional benefits. First, there is a certain level of existence value in these ecosystems, which is a value that is added to these projects purely by citizens just knowing that these ecosystems exist and they haven't been destroyed by sea level rise. A second benefit to both nourishment events and dune restoration is the restoration quality or the project's closeness to the natural ecosystem. Nature-based solutions, as I've said many times, draw on natural systems, which provide the ability to restore the ecosystem back to its original state, rather than seawalls, for example, which have actually been shown to further erosion. Firstly, and then finally, all of these projects provide crucial habitats and spawning areas for a number of species, many of which are endangered, thus creating and preserving these habitats in, and ecosystems restores critical biodiversity to the area. Now, based on our key findings, the Bayshore Bikeway Resiliency Project and beach nourishment events are considered highly cost-effective solutions. Dune restoration is not considered a cost-effective method given only the benefits that were included in our quantitative analysis. However, if the broad range of additional benefits is included in, is included in their consideration, the city still may designate this as a plausible response to sea level rise. The most cost-effective method of adaptation, of course, is beach nourishment, but it is recommended that the city implements multiple projects and kind of a phased approach to adaptation because in reality, zones one and zone two possess very different vulnerability, which necessitates various forms of adaptation, project planning, and implementation. Now, because the study looks to the future, many assumptions had to be made in order to complete our calculations. First, in zone one, to analyze the change in housing values due to the bikeway resiliency project, we used a study that was completed in Miami-Dade County. This is located in southern Florida, so in order to use their conclusions as a variable in our study, we had to assume that the housing markets in both Imperial Beach and Miami-Dade are similar in their response to climate adaptation projects. And then in zone two, there were multiple assumptions that had to be made. First, erosion rates for both sand and cobble were meticulously calculated by the city. However, these rates are highly sensitive to environmental factors, which makes them very un unpredictable. So we had to use our best available data as to what these rates will be from now until 2100. Secondly, the beach attendance estimates that were used in the beach nourishment benefits calculations were held constant throughout our study. In reality, these values will shift probably a lot. Um, there's been an increase in water pollution due to sewage coming across the border, which has led to a lot of beach closures in Imperial Beach, which will, of course, lead to a decrease in attendance. But the promise of new hotels and also, like Yash men mentioned, a renovated pier may actually increase attendance as well. And then third, the cost of materials in both beach nourishment and dune restoration were held constant throughout the study. These values will look, most likely shift, however, we were just an, unable to account for that potential change given the time frame of our project. These were the main assumptions that were made in our calculations. Like I said, given the time and resource constraints on this project, these were highly unavoidable assumptions, but it is important to consider any potential sources of uncertainty. So as you can probably tell, adaptation planning is a complex process filled with many barriers, causing some development projects to take even decades to implement. But given the speed at which global temperatures are rising, time is a luxury that many cities simply don't possess. Thus, my project focuses on quantifying the benefits of nature-based solutions, which have less data available on their performance, costs, and co-benefits. But because they do provide this wide range of benefits, it's very important to begin understanding how to quantify and communicate their benefits in order to support their implementation. Potential future work stemming from this project, I hope, would be quantifying some of the additional benefits that I mentioned, or taking the same work, the same framework, and applying it to other projects in different jurisdictions. 
That concludes my presentation, and I would just like to wrap up by giving a huge thank you to my committee members, my chair, Julia Chase, Jake Bratt, and Megan Openshaw. And of course, thank you all for listening. Any questions? Yeah, Yash. Totally. So I chose many of these projects because I based it off of their 2016 sea level rise vulnerability assessment, which goes into a lot of detail as to which um, projects the city will hope to implement in the future. That is kind of outdated, so I'll take that with a grain of salt. Um, the San Diego Regional Beach Sand Project Number 2 has been the most recent project that they participated in. I don't remember how much sand was deposited on the beach, but that did make quite an impact. And the sand dag is actually in the planning stage of the San Diego Regional Beach Sand Project number three. I haven't spoken to Imperial Beach officials specifically about if they would um, participate in that project, but there are different nature-based solutions, including beach nourishment, that are kind of in the works. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Jerry. <laughs> um, can you tell us why you chose a discount rate of 1%? Totally. That was a, that was a big uh, choice to make. Um, I ultimately did base this off of that same 2016 vulnerability assessment that I mentioned. The city performed many different cost-benefit analyses of both gray and nature-based solutions. They used a 1% discount rate, so I figured if it's good enough for the city, it's good enough for this project. Um, and they also cited an article, I'm not remembering the author's name, but the article mentioned that for any projects with a time scale of 75 years or longer, a discount rate of 1% is appropriate. And so given our time scale, I decided that is an appropriate discount rate here as well. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, great presentation. Thank you. My big question is when I see the visuals and I see that the residences and the are there isn't a lot of coastline. Yeah. So when you're talking whether it's beach nourishment or dunes, I don't really understand how you can avoid getting the levels like to the point. I mean, some of these houses they've got windows right there. Like, mm -hmm. wouldn't the sand be above the windows? I just don't understand it. That's a good point, and I, that is something that I actually did not take into consideration on my project. Um, that would, I hope, kind of going off of Alex's project, how bringing the community into a lot of these adaptation measures is very important. That is an aspect that would be very important to consider as how these projects would impact their, the community's livelihood. Um, one of the options for sea level rise response is managed and unmanaged retreat and also building regulations. That's kind of some of the options for how to respond to sea level rise. You have the managed and unmanaged retreat, building regulations, and then this um, preventative measures, which I focused on the preventative measures. The managed and unmanaged retreat and building regulations have been kind of not dismissed by officials, but it's not very politically viable because it does impact the community's way of life drastically. And so these adaptation measures are kind of seen as a better alternative as to how to respond to sea level rise. So it keeps them in their homes, which is a plus, but there will be some impacts, like you mentioned, that are important to consider. Uh, I was curious why you chose to keep the price of sand constant through the end of the century versus assuming like some sort of an inflation rate of a two or three percent or like the mm -hmm. global supply shortage of sand or how you arrived at that decision. Of course, that really just came down to the timeline that I had to complete this project. Uh, it's a one-year master's program. I think we all are very 
sad that it's only one year because we wish that we could do so much more with these projects. So that really just did come down to my timing. The same study that I've mentioned a couple of times, the 2016 vulnerability assessment completed by the city, um, I believe they accounted for some inflation in the sand. They either accounted for it or they looked at it and then decided not to because it wouldn't impact it too greatly. So that is a very important variable to consider. And if I had more time to work on this project, I would definitely consider that. Cool, thank you guys.